Hello everyone, welcome to our EM worship. Uh, we're so glad that all of you guys are able to join us for our online worship. Uh, as you guys may be aware, our on-site worship is closed for the time being, but I pray that as we continue to have this online worship, that we will treat it truly as worship, where we are coming before the presence of God to worship Him, to glorify Him, and to listen to His words. So at this time, why don't we begin with prayer. Father God, as we have come before you, of wanting to praise you, of wanting to worship you. Lord, we pray that you open our hearts so that we may continue uh, to have more of you within us, to have more of your words within us, that your words can truly come alive in our lives so that when people see us, that they will see the gospel message being spoken to them through our lives. Be with us, Lord. We pray for your guidance and your wisdom and keep us all healthy. We thank you, Lord, in all these things. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
turn your ears to heaven and hear the noise inside, the sound of angels all, the sound of angels' songs and all this full rocking, we could join and sing. All to Christ the King, how cost and how divine, this song of ours will rise. Oh, how cost and how divine, this love of ours will rise, will rise.
Into marvelous light I'm running Out of darkness, out of shame By the cross you are the truth You are the life, you are the way I once was fatherless I once was fatherless a stranger with no hope Your kindness waken me Waken me from my sleep Your love it beckons deeply A call to come and die By grace now I will come Take this life, take your life Sin has lost its power, death has lost its sting, from the grave you've risen, victoriously, into marvelous light I'm running, out of darkness, out of shame, by the cross you are the truth. You are the life, you are the way. My dead heart now is beating, my deepest things now clean. Your breath fills up my lungs, now I'm free, now I'm free. My dead heart now is beating, my deepest things now clean. Your breath fills up my lungs, now I'm free, now I'm free. Sin has lost its power, death has lost its sting, from the grave you've risen. Victoriously into marvelous light I'm running out of darkness, out of shame. By the cross you are the truth, you are the life, you are the way. Into marvelous light I'm running out of darkness, out of shame. By the cross, you are the truth, you are the life, you are the way. Lift my hands and spin around, see the light that I have found. Oh, the marvelous light, marvelous light. Lift my hands and spin around. See the light that I have found. Oh, the marvelous light, marvelous light. Sin has lost its power. Death has lost its sting. From the grave you've risen. Victorious into marvelous light I'm running out of darkness out of shame by the cross you are the truth you are the life you are the way into marvelous light I'm running out of darkness out of shame by the cross you are the truth you are the life, you are the way. Lift my hands and spin around. See the light that I have found. Oh, the marvelous light, marvelous light. Lift my hands and spin around. See the light that I have found. Oh, the marvelous light, marvelous light. 
we bow our hearts, we bend our knees. O Spirit, come make us humble. We turn our eyes from evil things. O Lord, we cast down our idols. We bow our hearts. We bend our knees. O Spirit, come make us humble. We turn our eyes from evil things. O oh Lord, we cast down our idols. So give us clean hands and give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Give us clean hands and give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. We bow our hearts. We bend our knees. Oh, Spirit, come make us humble. We turn our eyes from evil things. Oh, Lord, we cast down our idols. Let's sing it again. We bow our hearts. We bow our hearts. We bend our knees. Oh, Spirit, come make us humble. We turn our eyes from evil things. Oh, Lord, we cast down our idols. So give us clean hands and give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Oh, give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Oh, God, let this be a generation that seeks who seeks your face, O oh God of Jacob. Oh God, let us be a generation that seeks, who seeks your face, O oh God of Jacob. So give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Oh, give us clean hands and give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. So give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Oh, give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. At this time, I'd like for us to uh, pray together. Um, as we have sang, let us pray that we may have clean hands and pure hearts, that within our hearts is only the Word of God, so that our lives may be built on His words, and that we may be able to live lives of worship. 
where in every day of our lives and all the things that we are doing, we are worshiping Him. We are praising Him. For He is our God and He is our Father. So let us pray that we may be able to protect and to continue to live these lives as worshipers. So let us pray together. Father God, we thank you so much for calling us your own. And Lord, we thank you for allowing us to praise you and to worship you. For it is when we are in worship with you, when we are praising you, when we are listening to your words, that we are truly at peace and that we are truly living as we should be, as one with you, knowing of who you are and being in your presence. And Lord, although our worship is all online and our church is closed for the time being, Lord, let us do more to protect this time and place of worship in our lives that as we continue to be wherever we may be, in our homes, in our workplaces, that even in those places, that that may be the place of worship for us. So that all the things that we are doing, that we may be able to praise you and to be with you and to just enjoy this time with you, Lord. We pray that you continue to be with us, continue to guide us in what it means to live in faith and what it means to know more of you and to be in worship with you. We thank you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. And all these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's lift up loud praise and thanksgiving once more in our worship service. I want to take this time to welcome everyone to another beautiful Sunday here at our New Jersey Ordinary English Ministry. Uh, why don't we turn to our neighbors, uh, turn to our screens, let's put our hands out like this, and just take this time to bless one another and say, love the Lord your God with all your heart. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Amen, amen. Uh, we're blessed to be able to meet like this online for our worship service. Uh, as many of you have heard, uh, due to the increasing number of coronavirus cases in New Jersey, including members of our church, uh, we have decided to close the church building once again. Uh, we're not yet sure when we'll be able to open it, uh, but we ask that you continue to worship with us online and also to be able to pray for our community here, uh, pray for our members who are sick, uh, pray for our nation as a whole, and just pray that somehow that we'll be able to get through all of this, just continuing to rely and putting our faith in God. At this time, let's turn to our bulletins and we'll share today's important announcements. If you need a copy of the bulletin, you can find the copy, a link right underneath this video, or you could go to our website and you'll be able to see our bulletin. Uh, so a reminder, we haven't done this in a while, but a reminder of our online worship etiquette. Uh, we used to give this announcement early on. Uh, but the point is that we are worshiping God just the same way as we would if we were here in this place. Uh, we're going to worship on time at 12 p.m. Uh, we're going to praise just as if we were in this building. We're going to have our Bible ready with us, and we're not going to have any other electronic devices or any other thing that might distract us from worship. We're going to praise as we would normally do, and we'll prepare each time of worship with prayer. Also, if you'd like to give an offering, you could also give online offering. You can find the link once again underneath this video or on our website as well. You know, we're trying to say worship does not change uh, just because of your location. You know, whether you're worshiping at home, worshiping in your kitchen, your bedroom, your workplace, your car, or in this building, uh, worship remains the same. Therefore, we should try to worship with that same spirit, the same attitude that we would if we were able to come into this building. 
Also, for those who are interested in uh, membership orientation or just have any questions about this church, please let me know. You can send us a uh, notice online or you can send us a notice by email. Uh, we had a couple members join during this coronavirus uh, situation, this period, uh, with our online uh, membership orientation. And I personally enjoyed it a lot, being able to see people face-to-face, -face, uh, granted it's via Zoom, uh, to be able to speak with them, get to know them a little bit more, and introduce them into our community here. Uh, it's very blessed that we're able to continue to do this. So uh, if you're new to our church, even though you're joining with us online and you've never been to this church, it's okay. You know, sign up for our online uh, online um, membership orientation. You could shoot me an email. We'll be able to connect, and I'll be able to help you. And then we'll be able to set this up, and you could be a member of our church. And I promise you, uh, what we normally do is, you know, after a few months of all our newcomers, uh, we hold a big party for them. A big festival, that's what we call it, right? We can't do this right now, uh, but I'm going to promise all those of you who joined our church while we were in this pandemic era, uh, while, you know, you were able to join online, uh, once this corona thing, you know, fades away and goes away, uh, we're going to throw you the biggest, biggest, biggest festival, uh, the biggest welcoming party that we've ever done before, right? So if you want to join in that, uh, please join us for our online membership orientation, and we're going to be able to look forward to that together. Uh, Living Life devotional books were available at this church, uh, but for this upcoming week, we decided to close the church, so uh, you might not have yet had a copy. If you need a copy, uh, let me know. I'll be able to send it to you. I sent a few copies already via uh, mail. Uh, I'll try to get to them as soon as possible, uh, so if you need a copy of the November Living Life, let me know. Uh, just shoot me an email with your address, and I'll just be able to mail it out to you. Uh, you can look at the bulletin for the rest of today's important announcements. Uh, at this time, please take out your Bibles, and we're going to go over today's uh, passage. Our passage comes to us from Ezra chapter 3. We're reading from verses 10 to 13. Uh, we're continuing our Ezra project, as we like to say. Uh, so everyone, turn with me to Ezra chapter 3, and we'll be reading from verses 10 to 13. Uh, read with me these verses. Uh, hear now the word of God. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments and with trumpets and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals took their place to praise the Lord as prescribed by David, king of Israel. With praise and thanksgiving, they sang to the Lord, He is good, His love toward Israel endures forever. And all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the older priests and Levites and family heads who had seen the former temple wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this temple being laid, while many others shouted for joy. You know, no one could distinguish the sound of the shouts of joy from the sound of weeping, because the people made so much noise, and the sound was heard far away. Amen. At this time, before we go on to the message part of today's worship, I actually want to introduce a very special and very talented music group uh, who has sent in a very special praise for us today. Uh, the group is called Praisey. Uh, P-R-A-I-S-Y, Praisey. It consists of three wonderful, uh, three very kind-hearted and very, very talented uh, sisters who are members of our church. Uh, they have uh, offered to send this uh, special praise for us during this online worship that we're going to be having. Uh, so I know we're not here in this place, but join me and welcome these three amazing, talented sisters. And they'll be singing because of who you are. And afterwards, I'll be back with today's message. Shit. Of who you are. 
What is the most important trait uh, that you look for in a significant other? Uh, you can be honest. It's only me and you right here. There's no one else around. Uh, is it looks? Uh, is it height? Uh, is it potential for money? Is it kindness, uh, personality, compatibility, a sense of humor? Uh, it's probably going to be a lot of different variables and factors, if I had to guess. Uh, but there's one factor in my mind that I think ends up trumping everything else. Uh, one of the most undervalued traits out there, and we see it actually in today's passage. Uh, we're returning back to the book of Ezra today. Uh, last week, we saw the people return back, uh, build up the altar again, and restore the worship of God in their lives before they did anything. Uh, but now, they're called to begin the work that God had called them to do, which was to rebuild the temple again. Uh, as a matter of fact, two years had actually passed since the people of Israel uh, were able to return back to their land. After two long years of preparation, uh, they're now finally ready to begin building this temple. So why did it take two years? Why did it take so long? Why were they not able to begin right away? Well, there's logistic stuff, right? They had to prepare a lot of things. Uh, they had to prepare all the materials for the temple. They had to get all the wood ready, all the supplies, uh, the building materials, all that other stuff, right? Uh, that's part of the reason. But there was one thing that was more important for them to prepare. Uh, one additional thing that God wanted to prepare in them. It's the same trait that I consider the most important in a significant other. And that is actually the heart. God needed to prepare the hearts of the Israelites before they started building the temple. Uh, it's a little bit cheesy, I know, uh, but it's true. You know, in construction, building materials are very important. Uh, in dating, looks, and a sense of humor, very important. But above all of that, in both cases, the most important thing is the heart. Because everything comes out of the heart that you possess. And for the Israelites, it took two years for God to prepare their hearts. Uh, it took my wife two years for me to get to marriage, but it also took God two years to be able to prepare the hearts of the people. Uh, the most important thing, the most important thing that was necessary for them to begin the job that was right in front of them. And that's what God does. God prepares our hearts so we too can join in the work that he is doing. Because if you're not, our hearts are not ready, there's no way that we could actually do that work. So as we look at today's passage, uh, let's look at the heart that God wants us to possess. Let's look at the heart that God wants us to have today as he's inviting us to be able to join in on the work that he's doing right here. Uh, the first heart that we see is heart like a temple. You know, I know that doesn't make that much sense, but heart like a temple. What do I mean by that? Uh, let's go back to today's passage. We see in the opening verse in verse 10, it says, When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, uh, the priests in their vestments and with trumpets, and the Levites, the son of Asaph, with cymbals, uh, took their places to praise the Lord as prescribed by David, king of Israel. Uh, the people, they lay down the foundation of the temple, and what did they do? They started to rejoice. Uh, they laid down the bottom layer, and they had this huge dedication in honor of it. Why? Why was this temple so important for them? Why did they just rejoice just looking at the bottom layer, this foundation, just by looking at it? Why were they so happy and full of joy? What made the temple so important to them? Well, it was a place of worship. It was a place where people gathered for social events. It was a place where they were able to offer things to God. It was also a reminder that God's promise was with them at all times. It was a reminder of the promises that God gave to their forefathers, to David, to Solomon, who ended up building the temple. And for everybody else that came afterwards, it was a promise that God was with them. And that's why throughout the history of the Israelites, the temple is the most important building, the most important structure in their lives. Because it represented the presence of God in their midst. You know, it's a very different time that they lived than for us. But they believed that that temple was the dwelling place of God. That God existed right there. And as long as the temple existed, 
that God was in their midst. And for 70 years, while they were in exile, they didn't have access to this temple. They didn't have this temple. And now, because they're finally able to restore the structure, you know, they have this joy in their hearts. You know, with everything else that's going on right now, uh, this new normal, as we like to call it, uh, it's got me thinking about the nature of worship and the nature of our church building. You know, we were once again unable to worship in this building. It's actually the third time that we had to take this break. And part of me thinks that it won't be the last. You know, we'll be able to reopen, but perhaps there'll be more setbacks. You know, we're once again unable to worship in this building, and it's really saddening me. You know, during this week, uh, we closed the building shut. We put a lock on it, and we put up signs saying, you're not allowed to enter. Uh, you know, I don't know if you guys know this. Of course you guys don't know this, but the mailman and the uh, crossing guards, the school guards, every day they come into our church to use the bathroom. But we told them this week, we're sorry, uh, you guys can't use this building for the bathroom. And you guys just have to use someone else. You know, only essential personnel, uh, people that really need to be here in this place will be allowed and because of all the things that's been going on for the last few months, uh, I've been forced to just kind of think about uh, the nature of church and question what a church is. You know, what is the purpose of church? Uh, what is the purpose of a church building? Uh, it's a place of worship. It's a place of fellowship. It's a place where the people of God can come together to praise, to share, to love one another. Uh, it's a beautiful place. You know, I can't wait until everybody is able to come back here and be able to worship God without any restrictions or any limitations. Uh, but does that mean that this church building is the only place where these things are possible? And the answer is no, of course not. That even without a church building, we're still able to come together and worship. We're still able to come together and praise. We're still able to come together for fellowship, to share, and to be able to share our love with one another. That the church building, as amazing and as important as it is, you know, it's not necessary for all any of these things. You know, before the temple, before the Israelites built the temple, uh, they had the tabernacle in the wilderness. That's what we see. And the tabernacle is so important. It was this huge tent, but it was basically a temple within the wilderness that they could, you know, put up and put down anytime that they want. It was a movable tent. It was meant to represent the dwelling place of God, very similar to what the temple was for the Israelites later on. But the tabernacle and the temple are not modeled after any other building, as a matter of fact. Uh, they're not modeled after any other building that came before them. It's actually very unique because the temple and the tabernacle, they're actually modeled after a very specific place. All the dimensions that are part of it, all the ornaments that we see in it, all the ritual things that we see within the temple, they're actually modeled after the Garden of Eden. Now that sounds kind of strange. Why is this temple building modeled after the fabled Garden of Eden? You know, everything inside the temple, we have the cherubims, the angels around it, we have the palm trees on its door, uh, we have the way that everything is positioned, even the flowing waters within it, everything shows that it's like a miniature Garden of Eden. Why? Why was it so important for the temple and the tabernacle that came before it to represent this Garden of Eden? You know, temple was the place where people came to meet God. There's a lot of different rituals, a lot of different rules and laws that, you know, came with it. But ultimately, it was a place meant where people of God were able to meet God. And even the tabernacle was often called the tent of meeting for that place. And the Garden of Eden was where a place where people, in this case Adam and Eve, could walk with God without any limitations and without any restrictions, any barriers at all. And that's why the temple is a miniature Garden of Eden. That's what it represents. It was an area where people could come, granted only for a little bit, to be able to shed their sins and to be able to meet God, hopefully without any limitations and restrictions. You know, I love our building here so much. I love coming to work every morning. I love 1449 Anderson Avenue. That's our address. I'm here right now in the place where we normally worship. Uh, I'm here more than any other place in my life. I'm here much more than I'm at home. Uh, but I don't know if you guys know this, but before we bought this building, we used to rent it. Uh, we used to rent it from a Jewish community center. We could only use it certain hours during Sunday. So every Sunday, we would come very early 
uh, me and about, you know, 20, 30 other people will come very early, and we would have to set everything up from scratch. Uh, we weren't even allowed in this gym, this sanctuary that we're using right now. We could only use the main sanctuary upstairs. About 20, 30 of us will come every morning and just from scratch uh, set up the whole place. Uh, that means the, uh, the projection screens, the speakers, the stands, the mics, the instruments, drums, everything. You name it, anything that's on stage, uh, the banners that we use every morning. We would have to come early on Sunday and set it up. And after worship, what do we have to do? We need to just take everything off. Uh, I remember used to coming every morning and just, just sweating every morning just before I even got to, you know, worship, and even before I got to preach in front of the kids, I would just be like just sweating all the time. And I used to hate it so much. Uh, I hate it so much. I'm just so happy that now that we own this building that we don't even have to do that anymore. I just love this building so much. You know, so nice. And I'm glad that we have all of this, that we have this fantastic space to worship, that we have this nice sound systems everywhere. We have this fancy lights uh, with different colors. I'm just so happy that we have all of this. Uh, but more than ever, in the midst of all that is happening around us, I'm beginning to realize, thankfully, that it doesn't mean a thing. Even if we have all of these things, it doesn't mean a thing if we're not actually meeting God in this place. That it's not enough to come physically to the place of worship. That it actually means nothing if our hearts are not ready to receive him first. If our hearts are not prepared, it doesn't matter what things that we have here. It doesn't matter how fancy our building is, how fancy our worship equipment is. It doesn't, nothing matters. This building doesn't matter at all if we don't have that heart ready to receive Christ, ready to receive God, ready to worship. You know, your heart, our hearts has to be like that temple. Our hearts has to be the Garden of Eden, a place where there is no separation between me and God, that our hearts have to always be ready to be able to receive Christ, be able to worship Him at any time and any place. You know, today's passage, it reminded me of uh, Matt Redman. You know, you guys know Matt Redman? He's a famous praise leader. Uh, he's a famous composer of a lot of the praise songs that we sing, right? Uh, but he's most known for writing and singing this song called The Heart of Worship. It's a very famous song. It's a very famous story about how he ended up writing this song. Uh, the song came to him while he was serving a church uh, out in England. Uh, but during the time when he was there, the church was experiencing some hard times. Uh, from the outside, it looked like a nice church, a growing church, a good church, whatever, by all standards of this world. Uh, but the pastor, the head pastor at that time, he understood there were problems that were coming inside his church. Uh, the number one problem was apathy. Uh, there was a lack of passion. You know, there's a lack of, you know, pure worship in that place. That's what he felt. So people were just going through the motions, coming to church, because that's what they always did. They couldn't really find meaning, especially in the praise and worship section. And that's what the pastor felt each week in and out. So he did something super bold, uh, something that I don't know if I'm bold enough to do, something that, you know, you rarely or never hear from anywhere else. What he did was he got rid of the sound system. He got rid of all the speakers, all the sound systems, all the instruments in his church, and he got rid of the praise band. Now think about this. This is a praise band that is led by Matt Redman. Uh, amazing, you know, he had amazing session people around him, uh, but he said, no, I'm going to get rid of you guys for a time. You know, in my mind, uh, always David and Debbie, they're the number one and number two praise leaders, but Matt Redman is a close third in my mind, Right? And to be able to say to, to Matt Redman and say, no, I don't need you anymore. You sit down. There will be no more praise worship. You'll not be leading praise for a little while. How amazing and how bold it is for this pastor to do that. You know, some of the band members, they took this, you know, they took offense to this, and they ended up quitting. And many of them left that church, they said. Uh, but Matt Redman, he stayed. He wanted to know what it would look like. He was curious. So he ended up staying at this church, even though he wasn't leading praise anymore. So for a few weeks, they had praise with no music, and they said it was really awkward in the beginning. You know, think about it, right? Uh, people singing without any instruments. They have to hear themselves sing a cappella. Oh, it's very tough. You know, if I had to sing like that, it would be very tough on me. If I had to hear other people sing a cappella without instruments, I don't know. That would be pretty tough as well. Uh, but after a while, he said the people came together in a spirit of prayer, in a spirit of spontaneous praise. And for the first time in a very long time, they're able to truly worship God. 
And remember, the essence of worship had nothing to do with their sound system. It had nothing to do with Matt Redmond. It had nothing to do with their instruments. But it had everything to do with the heart that they were bringing. And in all of that, after going through all of that, Redmond ended up writing the song, The Heart of Worship, describing what happened at the church. And this is how he writes. He says, when the music fades, all is stripped away. And I simply come, longing just to bring something that's of worth, that will bless your heart. And he writes, I'm coming back to the heart of worship. And it's all about you, Jesus. It's all about you. I think that's a perfect portrayal of what it means to have a heart of worship. What is a heart of worship? A heart of worship is one that says it's always open to Christ. It's one that says that it's all about you. It's only about you, Jesus. That I don't need anything else. I'm always ready to receive you. And I pray that everyone, especially today, especially in light of all that is happening, that we're able to take this time while we might be away from one another, while we're just worshiping alone in our homes or with our spouses in our homes, uh, worshiping through this video, that I pray that everyone is not only able to restore the worship that they have, but they're able to maintain this heart of worship. That this heart of worship comes first before anything else. That we're able to ask God, Lord, help me prepare my heart for worship so that I may be ready to receive you, Christ. And then after all of that, that we're finally able to come together and be able to come together here for worship. Uh, secondly, the heart that God prepared for the Israelites was a heart of thanksgiving. Uh, it says in verse 11, with praise and thanksgiving, they sang to the Lord. Uh, he is good. His love toward Israel endures forever. And all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. You know, looking at the foundation, uh, people, they couldn't help but respond with praise and thanksgiving. Seeing once again where God's temple was going to lie, they started screaming up to God. They gave thanks and they praised God and they said, He is good. His love toward Israel endures forever. You know, it wasn't an accident that they responded with thanksgiving. You know, this past week I read an article from a psychologist who taught at uh, Harvard. Uh, he said he had this experiment. He suggested that we could train our brains to become more grateful uh, by just setting aside five minutes a day, just five minutes a day of practicing gratitude, that we could actually practice giving thanks. Uh, he had this experiment. He had a whole bunch of people come, and they were asked five minutes a day, the same time each day, uh, to write down three things that they were thankful for. Three very specific things, though. Uh, it wasn't big things. It wasn't large things. But it had to be very specific. You know, some people wrote, you know, I'm thankful for this uh, delicious takeout that I got to eat today. Or some people wrote, I'm so happy that my daughter gave me a hug. Another person wrote, I'm thankful that my boss complimented me for my work. Another person wrote, uh, wrote I'm so thankful to have Pastor Stephen as my pastor. Sorry, I made up that last part. Uh, but these participants, they simply expressed thanks by giving three very specific things that they were thankful for each day. At the end of the month, the researchers followed up, and they followed that those who practiced gratitude were happier and less depressed. That makes sense. Those who practiced gratitude only for one week, actually, a month later, they were still more happy and less depressed. I'm going to repeat that one more time. They only did this for one week, but they followed up a month later. And yet they were still happier and less depressed. Remarkably, they followed up three months later. Some of these people only practiced gratitude for one week. The same people, even after three months, they were more content, more peaceful, more happy, and less depressed. Remarkably, after six months, they followed up again. Once again, these people, for five months and three weeks, they didn't do this. They only did this for one week. But six months later, they were still happier, more content, and less depressed. Just by giving thanks for five minutes for one week of their lives. Imagine that. Imagine that. How amazing the power of giving gratitude is that it's able to change the actual wiring in your head, changing your perspective. 
Now imagine this. Imagine that we could do this with God each day. Instead of just doing three random things in our lives, think about if we were able to give thanks to God just three things each day, what amazing things would happen in our lives. Imagine how much our lives would change, how much differently we'll be able to see this world if we were able to give thanks just three times to God each day. Imagine that. Yet it's difficult for us to even do that much. You know, because when we have a heart of thanksgiving, It opens our eyes to see what God is doing right now in this moment. It's opening our eyes to see what God has already done for us in our lives. So what are three things that you want to thank God today? Are there three things? I guarantee there's a lot more than three things. You know, the people of Israel, they praised God. They gave thanks. And they said, he is good and his love toward us endures forever. Uh, They lived 70 years in captivity, yet they were still able to proclaim his love for us endures forever. You know, he was good when they had their old temple. He was good when they had no temple. And now that they're laying down the foundation of this new temple, he is still good and his love endures forever. It means that regardless of anything else that was happening in their lives, that God's love for them and God's goodness, it never changed. It was always there. And it's always going to be there. And that is why they're able to proclaim this and give thanks to God. It means that a heart of thanksgiving does not only give thanks when good things are happening. It's not like, I got a new car. Thank you, God. I got a new house. Thank you. Not none of that. It's thanking God exactly for who he is, regardless of anything that's happening in our lives. A heart of thanksgiving is one that knows that God is good and his love endures forever in our lives. It doesn't matter what is happening. It doesn't matter what we're going through. His love for us is always there and it's always good. You know, this past week, uh, for me as a pastor, it was actually a pretty tough week. Uh, We had uh, news of some of our members testing positive for coronavirus. And because of that, I've been reaching out to them and seeing if there's anything that we could do as a church. And I had to talk with a lot of them and it was tough. You know, hearing people who were sick, uh, hearing people going through, you know, just the uh, pain and, and suffering. Uh, and, you know, when I was talking to them, just hearing their responses, they were telling me, you know, oh, I'm fine, I'm fine. Uh, but you could hear it in their voice, you know, how sick they really were. Uh, but I remember speaking to one of the husbands of one of our members who caught the coronavirus. Uh, and this husband, this guy, I knew very, very well. And he told me, oh, my wife, she's okay. Uh, she's doing okay. And I was really grateful. Uh, but this is what he added. He said, you know, it's actually a good time for his wife uh, to be separated from him and from their uh, young child. So his wife could relax a little bit. And his wife was just so busy taking care of the family and doing all the work that she has to do. Uh, So it's kind of good that she's able to relax and be apart from them and just rest on her own. You know, he made it sound like she was going on some kind of vacation. uh, But obviously I knew that was not the case. Uh, But just hearing, you know, uh, the love that he had for her in his voice. You know, I spoke to others and across the board, in the midst of their sickness, in the midst of their fears and worries, uh, they were still worrying about others. They were worried that they were able to give the disease to other people. They were giving concern to the church over their own well-being. And they were asking for prayers, uh, asking for them to be able to rely on God even more this time. And it was just a reminder of how blessed we truly are. That even in the midst of all of this, even in the midst of all the pain that they were going through, uh, they were able to say that God is good. They're able to say that they loved being part of this community. They're able to say, I'm going to rely on God even more. So please, please pray for me. And it was such a strong source of strength for me. And even though I was supposed to, you know, give them the strength, uh, just hearing their responses, I was just so grateful for who they were. So I want to ask you today, what are you grateful for? If I ask you what are the three things that you want to say to God right now, what would those three things be? You know, what are the three specific things that you are grateful to God? Uh, Things that I'm grateful for today. Uh, I was grateful that I got an extra hour of sleep today. I'm grateful that this year is almost over, that we only have two months left until 2020 is over, because there's no way 2021 could be worse, right? And I'm also grateful for having this amazing EM family that we could gather like this. Uh, Granted, we're not able to meet in person, but we're still able to gather like this. So what are your three things? What are your three things that you're grateful for? You know, let us include this at the end, that God is good and that his love for us endures forever. 
And as we hold on to that, as we give thanks to God for all of this, let us be able to use his goodness and the knowledge of his love enduring forever for us to be able to overcome anything that comes our way and to be able to protect the thanksgiving that we have in our hearts. Uh, lastly, we see in today's passage, uh, God prepares us by giving us a heart that is full of hope. We'll read the final two verses of today's passage. It says, But many of the older priests and Levites and family heads who had seen the former temple wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this temple being laid, while many others shouted for joy. Uh, no one could distinguish the sound of the shouts for joy uh, from the sound of weeping because the people made so much noise and the sound was heard far away. We know that many people are rejoicing, but there are also many older people, the Levites and the family heads who were there when the original temple was there. Uh, they were in dismay and they wept loudly. They wept so loudly that it mixed in with the, you know, the shouts of joy. and No one could really tell the difference between the two. And the reason why they wept was because they compared this new foundation uh, to the formal temple that they had seen. And they knew that it didn't compare to the older one. You know, Solomon, he built this amazing structure. But now this new temple, just by looking at the foundation, they knew that it couldn't compare to its original state. They knew it wouldn't be the same. They knew that the old was going to be better than this new one. Uh, this past week, you know, we were having a pastor's meeting. It was a very casual meeting. We are talking. And when pastors come together, we talk about the things that we actually, you guys probably think that we talk about. Uh, we talk about God. We talk about church. Uh, we talk about what's going on with our members and everything. Uh, but for some reason, a couple of days ago when we were talking and having this meeting, um, Meg Ryan came up. I have no idea why. I'm probably uh, the one that brought it up. I have no idea how this happened, but Meg Ryan came up. And Pastor DJ was there, Pastor DJ who just led praise right now. And it was quite the whole conversation, right? But as soon as Meg Ryan came up, he said, who's Meg Ryan? He said, who's Meg Ryan? You guys are talking about Meg Ryan. Who is this Meg Ryan? And as soon as he said that, I don't know why, but I had so much anger inside of me just creep up. Uh, I think the first reason I got angry was because uh, it made me feel old. You know, Pastor DJ is a little younger than I am. But the fact that he didn't know Meg Ryan and I knew Meg Ryan meant there's a whole generational gap between us. And I felt really old in that time. Secondly, I thought, how do you not know who Meg Ryan is? She's like a super, super movie star. How do you not know who Meg Ryan is? So he said, you know what? I don't know who Meg Ryan is. Can you compare her to someone of this time right now? Compare her to another celebrity that, you know, she's comparable with. Just so she, he has an idea of what we're talking about. And the answer was no one. There's no one that's going to compare to Meg Ryan. There's no celebrity right now that's on the same level as Meg Ryan. Why? Because in my mind, the older is better. The older I get, I realize the past is better than the present. And the more this comes true in my life. The older is better no matter what. The schools when, when I was there were much better than the schools now. A customer service when I was younger is a lot better than the customer service today. Movies definitely were a lot better back in the day than now. Music Music's a lot better before, when I was younger, than there's. I have no idea what the people are saying right now when I listen to modern music. The past is better. That's what I thought during this whole time. And the older people, I realize I'm kind of old now. The older people in today's passage, uh, the older leaders, they felt the same way. I, I, I you know, I'm, I, I understand where they're coming from. I understand exactly what they're saying. They see this new temple, this temple that is a modest replication of this old temple, and they knew that it wasn't as good as it used to be. It wasn't what they had. It wasn't Solomon's temple. And it broke their hearts. And they got really, really sad. And they started weeping, you know, very loudly. And it just broke their hearts, knowing that this new structure was not going to compare to what they had before. But what God shows us today and throughout the rest of Scripture was that this was not the end. That this temple, even though they're building it now, it was never meant to be the end. You know, we actually see in another passage, in another book, uh, them addressing these people, these people who are weeping aloud. We see in Haggai chapter 2, verse 9, it says, The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place, I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. You know, Haggai tells them, 
that the glory of this house right now, even though you guys don't see it, even though it looks tiny and small to you, is going to surpass the glory of the old house. That this temple, the glory within it, is going to surpass anything that came before it. And there will actually be peace that comes with it. And that's exactly what happens. You know, physically, the temple itself gets, you know, reconstructed, it gets added, and everything else goes on. By the time we get to the time of Jesus, hundreds of years later, this temple is magnificent. It's huge. It's, it's massive. So much bigger than when Solomon built it. But more than that, it was a place where peace came. It was a place where true shalom the true idea of peace came through Jesus Christ. And what they're trying to say is that what you see right now is not what it's going to end up like. It's not, it means that the work right now that you think is done is not done. And that there's going to be so much more that's going to happen to you. Right now, all you can see is this tiny little foundation of this small, modest temple. But later on, it's going to be so much more glorious. And God's going to use it to do so many amazing things, much more than you could even fathom right now. That's exactly what happened. You know, the people of Israel, they spent 70 years away, but they got to return. Why? Because God promised it. God said, after 70 years, you will return, and I'm going to prosper you. I'm going to give you hope. I'm going to give you a future. I'm going to have no one hurt you anymore. I'm going to give you all of these things. And that's exactly what happened. You know, God promised many things before they were exiled, and every one of those things came true. It meant that God's promise for them was always alive and always going to come true no matter what. That same promise is available for us today. That the same promise and the hope that comes with that promise is still alive within us right now. That no matter what is going on, that it's always there, it's always present, and it will never leave us. Like I said, 2020 is almost over. It will pass us. COVID-19, someday will pass us. And if something else comes afterwards, I guarantee you that too shall pass. But the everlasting hope that God gives us will always be with us. Will always be in our hearts to hold. You know, a couple days ago, we announced for the first time that our church was going to close. Uh, We announced that there were members of our communities that were sick. And then, of course, of all the things that's going on, we had to close our church. Uh, A few days later, though, uh, we got a package in the mail from one of the deacons in our church. And it came with a note. Uh, The deacon wrote a note saying that she had contracted the virus many, many months ago, very early on uh, during COVID. And because she did it, she had all this medication, all the supplies that helped her and her husband, you know, get through with it. And she wanted to share it with others. So she sent everything that she had. Uh, don't worry, it's all legal, it's all good stuff. Uh, she shared, she just wanted to share that with anybody else that might be in need. Uh, we had another member come to us and they said, you know what, these people that have coronavirus, you don't have to tell us who they are, but we want to, you know, provide some services with them. And this couple, they owned a catering service. So what they did was they provided food for us to be able to deliver to all the families who were hurting because they know it's difficult to cook. It's difficult to prepare food while they're sick, and some of them have families and everything like that. So they wanted to provide good food, healthy food, soul food for them uh, so they could help them in their recovery. That's what they did. They prepared all these amazing, huge bags, and what we did was we started delivering them. A couple days later, another person who owned the restaurant, they came to us and said, you know what? We want to give out free uh, food as well. We want to provide at least one really good meal for them. Uh, to be able to help them just a little bit, you know, just a little bit in their recovery, if that's okay. And once again, this couple, they came to us, they provided all the food, and we as pastors, we went around, uh, we were delivery men. I was a delivery man this whole week, uh, but I was really happy to do so. You know, this year, this moment, this season, it might not be going the way that you're expecting it. Uh, For me, it's definitely not. For this church, it's not. And I know there'll be more unexpected things that may come our way. But, No matter what happens, let us first respond with a heart of worship, a heart that is ready to make it all about Jesus, a heart that is ready to receive Jesus, a heart that is ready to put Jesus first and to glorify him before anything else. And let us also respond with a heart of thanksgiving that in the midst of anything, in the midst of everything, that we're still able to give thanks. And let us respond lastly with a heart of hope 
knowing that God's promises, even though we may not be able to see it right now, that they will come true in our lives. Let us pray. At this time, just join me. Uh, wherever you are, just join me for this time of prayer. And just be able to turn to God. Uh, just turn your focus, attention to Him. And just say, Lord, help me to put my faith in You. Lord, in the midst of all that is going on, it's so difficult right now. Help me to put my faith and total trust in You, Lord. That before I respond in different ways, help me to be able to worship You. Help me to be able to respond by giving thanks to You. And help me to never lose the hope that you have given me. Just be able to just confess this and just pray this together. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you so much for allowing us to come together for this time of worship. Uh, even in the midst of everything that's going on, that we're still able to come together as a community, as a family, and be able to praise and worship you here in this place. Lord, um, it's so difficult these days to see the good. Uh, sometimes it's very difficult for us to even see you in the midst of everything that's going on. There's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of fear. Uh, just so many unknown things that are just happening to us. Lord, we pray that in response to all of this, that we're able to respond first with a heart of worship, a heart that turns to you first, a heart that surrenders everything that we have to you first, a heart that strips away everything else and makes it all about you, Jesus, first. And secondly, let us respond with a heart of thanksgiving that our thanks that we give, the gratitude that we have is not contingent on how we feel. It's not contingent on some gifts that we receive in this moment. But it's all about you, Lord. About who you are and what you have already done for us. With the victory that is already granted for us in our lives. And help us to hold on to the heart of hope, Lord. You have given us this promise. You have given us uh, that this promise of a blessing, a promise of prosperity, a promise that you will continue to be with us. And even though we might not be able to see it in this moment right now, help us to hold on to this promise and just be able to look towards you and be able to overcome anything that comes our way by holding on to this heart that you are preparing for us. Lord, we pray for all our brothers and sisters who are in need, all our brothers and sisters who are ill at this very moment. Show them once again that you're not only our Lord and Savior, but you are our mighty healer, that you are our great healer, that you are with us. And help them, Lord, heal them in this moment. Grant them the peace that they so need and desire, Lord. Just continue to be with them and show them that you will never leave their side. And even in the midst of all of this, help them to glorify you, Lord. Lord, we thank you and we love you. We pray all this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us respond to today's worship with praise. Word. 
worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, a name above every other name. Jesus, the only one that could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, a name above every other name. Jesus, the only one that could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever be. We live for you. We live for you. Holy there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Holy there is no one like you, there is none beside you, open up my eyes in wonder, show me who you are and lead me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. I will put my trust in you alone. And I will not be shaken. I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. I will put my trust in you alone. And I will not be shaken. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none.
run beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. I will build my life. I will put my trust in you alone, and I will not be shaken. I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. I will put my trust in you alone, and I will not be shaken. Holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I Just because he lives. Everyone have another blessed day, and we'll see you next time at the same time next week.